Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your oasis of sanity in a mad, mad world. I am uh, Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Uh, hello, married people, and Mazel Tov to Nick Gillespie. Please clap, listening audience, for the newly married Senior Gillespie. Howdy. Hi, Matt. Happy Monday. It is a happy Monday, uh, except for our, our friends down in North Carolina and East Tennessee and uh, parts of Florida as well, getting absolutely hammered by Hurricane Helene in ways that we're only now beginning to kind of comprehend. It's going to be an unfolding uh, horror for a lot of people. So to the extent that any of you can hear us, uh, we're thinking of you. All right. So uh, before diving into and also divining into um, the amazing corruption scandal in New York City, uh, a quick word. Uh, from our sponsors over at Qualia Life. Uh, friends, have you heard about Senolytics? Senolytics is the name we give to a category of ingredients discovered over the past decade or so, which could prove to be a game changer for healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. Here's how Senolytics work. As we age, all of us, even Paul Rudd, accumulate senescent cells in our body. Okay, maybe he doesn't. Senescent cells are the ones that cause symptoms of aging, aches and discomfort, slow workout recovery, bad roundtable hosting moderation, uh, sluggish mental and physical energy. These zombie cells are old and worn out, taking up space and nutrients from your healthy cells. But now through uh, senolytics, you can prune these dead cells uh, by taking qualia, Senolytic. Qualia Senolytic is a vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO supplement, and you only need to take it twice a month to remove those zombie cells and keep them from making you feel old. Uh, to resist aging at the cellular level, just go to qualialife.com slash roundtable to get up to 50% off and use the code roundtable at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's Q-U-A-L-I-A life dot com slash roundtable or just go to select GNC locations by whatever means do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Uh, just amazing scenes in the country's largest city and place of evidence, evidence for half of us. Uh, Mayor Eric Adams, the uh, great backlash hope for many people who were fed up with urban misgovernance uh, before, during, and after the year of our devil uh, 2020, was indicted last week on five federal counts, including bribery, conspiracy, fraud, and soliciting illegal foreign campaign donations from the Turkish government. Uh, these were the fruits of just one of what appears to be four ongoing investigations. Uh, into the Adams administration. Uh, it's already seen resignations from the police commissioner, the school's chancellor, the building commissioner, a bunch of other people besides. Nearly uh, two dozen senior officials have gotten their phones seized, houses searched, and so forth. Uh, Catherine, I'm absolutely torn. On one hand, uh, it's the Southern District of New York. Um, they're not our friends, uh, and uh, they have a track record of kind of stretching uh, on some cases legally. Uh, including one that we talked about last week in your absence. Uh, on the other hand, the details of this are hilarious. Uh, Adam's like handing over a burner phone and then saying he doesn't remember the password. You have like some of his officials getting caught uh, in an investigation and then going into the bathroom and deleting the app that they did the secret conversations on and uh, whole grown ass officials uh, having secret apartments in Wall Street to do the crimes. <laughs> Uh, so how should I feel about this? Because I'm torn. Yeah, I mean, you know, just because you hate the cops doesn't mean you shouldn't also hate the criminals. And I think this is a good one for that lesson. Um, Adam seems like a, an idiot is a, a thing that I have thought for a while. And obviously, he's not a wholesale idiot. He's he's many kinds of smart because you don't. He's get not the he kind is. of idiot you can get at Costco. No, he's, he's not a wholesale idiot. He's a Boxes retail idiot. idiot. A wholesale yeah. idiot, right? I'm it's, it's, very it comes in larger. That's Thank where you. Diddy gets his, his Can you Adams. Please explain the joke I'm so, slower. Go I'm ahead. I'm so Catherine. mad that that made me sincerely laugh. Okay. So he obviously has certain kinds of intelligence because you don't get where you are, where he is without that. But um, this has really, to, for me, brought together every single little bit of kind of vaguely corrupt, vaguely stupid behavior into a, oh, yeah, that makes sense moment. 
Um, the the tidbit that I enjoyed, uh, which I learned about on the Daily, the New York Times' podcast that I hate slash love listen to regularly, is um, you know he had this story that he told for his whole campaign about um, a fallen fellow officer, a photo that he carried around in his wallet for all these years, and uh, when asked, you know, just kind of in the course of like a normal piece, like, oh, we'd love to actually like take a photo of that photo to illustrate the piece. Uh, and it immediately became clear that his staff had printed a picture off the Internet and like done that thing that you do when you're in elementary school where you like soak it in coffee to make it look old. Like it's a um, colonial document. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like a treasure map. Um, yeah. So like just that little one just reminded me again, like this dude is not actually the brightest bulb. And so I think a lot of this comes down to. Um, yes, it's corruption, but more importantly, it just shows like horrifically bad judgment. Nick, um, the history of New York City is and its governance is a history of corruption, uh, including its mayors, uh, kind of most of them <laughs> over the years, one way or the other. Is there something about the culture of the place? Uh, is there something about the structure of government and the amounts of regulation and people living on top of each other? Keeping in mind that like at, at, the, at the root of this conflict is a uh, 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 quicker than would have otherwise happened uh, an expedited uh, approval of a Turkish consulate building um, here, or is it a little bit of both or just coincidence? What do you think? I Well, I, I think you're on to something that, you know, what the Turks wanted mostly was the ability to finish stuff in New York. And that speaks to, you know, the regulatory hell that this place represents. Um, and the problem, though, you know, and that was uh, the the first contacts came when uh, Adams was Brooklyn uh, Borough President, and um, it goes to his lack of character and even more importantly political vision that he he didn't use that as an opportunity to to denounce you know, the way that uh, New York does business for everybody. He took it, you know, in order to get like extra, you know, premium snacks or a hot dish on an airline you know, going to Turkey or something like that, or, or to get nuts. a slight room upgrade where he didn't have to pay for, you know, higher quality Wi-Fi or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, this- The it's, best detail for that, just to interject, is that at yeah. some point, uh, this is according to the indictment, so buyer beware and whatnot, but uh, his uh, contact in Turkish Airlines, who was trying to like uh, put the squeeze on him a little bit, uh, uh, regarding an upcoming flight, and then something that uh, Turkey wanted in response, uh, said, hey man, Seat number 52 is empty. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't want to sit in seat number 52, yeah. Eric Adams. It's incredible. No, I, I mean, this is the equivalent of being bribed by saying like, okay, you'll get free lifetime guacamole at Chipotle. You know, it, it, the, the I just want to say that bribe so would low. work on me for anything. Yeah. Like you could. Well, uh, you know, and this goes to <laughs> Adam's Adam. next Ed note is just in praise of Chipotle. <laughs> Adam, among many other obviously weird, if not totally insane things, you know, claims to be a vegan and that veganism cured his vision in his left eye. His right eye was fine. <laughs> but then after he, he went on and on, this is kind of like the Robert Venable photo of, of his fallen friend who he loved so much that he had a staff clip a printed out photo of him and then doctor it to make it look old. Um, you know, he, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm a super vegan. And then his his staff clarified that that means he eats fish most days. You know, so it's like, OK, this guy either doesn't know what he's talking about or is just a liar. Um, but to go back to the substance here, I, I agree. I'm, I'm skeptical of the prosecution just because we know that federal prosecutors are bullshit artists and liars and they stretch and extend things. To me, the real question, we know Eric Adams is an idiot. Uh, this is a guy who at one point went on a long tear about how cheese is as addictive as heroin, um, you know, which was like, uh, that's, you know, that's what you want in a mayor. Dr. Carl um, Hart who maybe agrees. A, at the... <laughs> At the end of uh, 2023, he was asked on WPIX Channel 11 on, you know, a, a, a New York City public affairs show that nobody watches, you know, what's great about New York? And he said, New York is the only city in the world where you can wake up to terrorists, <laughs> you know, uh, flying into the World Trade Center. And yeah. then you can celebrate somebody opening a new business the same day, you know, and yeah. maybe take it a Broadway show. It's like, what is wrong with this guy? As a mayor, he sucks. And this is like, you you know, if mayors are going to be kind of corrupt, that's one thing. But like, 
you know, he's not getting the garbage picked up. The roads suck. The schools continue to suck. Um, everything is bad here. And if he had used the need for the Turks to get their consulate, you know, finish quicker, that would have been a great way to start talking about building regulation and all of that kind of stuff. But he doesn't do that. And instead, he also scapegoats people. You know, he simultaneously keeps saying that uh, New York is a sanctuary city for immigrants and migrants, but then he blames 50,000 uh, foreign migrants who are here legally, who come to New York for bankrupting the city, even though he gave a $432 million contract to provide housing for migrants to a company. It was a no-bid contract to a company that has no experience doing this and by every indication are completely incompetent. So people like Ed Koch, who I, I don't think was, uh, you know, was corrupt. I don't think that uh, Michael Bloomberg was corrupt or Rudy Giuliani or David Dinkins when they were running the city. I don't think they were corrupt in any kind of obvious way. But one thing that almost all of them did, and certainly uh, 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 Giuliani and Koch and uh, Bloomberg, they created a, a vibe in the city that this city was going forward and it was getting better and that, it, or, you know, under Koch, that it could survive and could come back under Giuliani, that it was going to be better than it was when he took over. And Bloomberg, you know, really built the city. I mean, I have a lot of problems with many of his, uh, you know, particular uh, policies, but he made New York great, you know, for business and hence for everybody else to live here. And when you look at somebody like de Blasio, the guy before Adams, he was awful on all counts. The only successful thing he did was kill a groundhog when he went to Puxatani, Pennsylvania, and like fumbled one and it fell and then later died of its injuries. Eric Adams is a complete zero on all of this. Plus, he is obviously not in touch with any kind of basic reality. So my problem with Eric Adams is his policies and his personality. Peter, let's talk a little bit, pick up some of that vision thing stuff. Um, and I'm going to ask you to take a journey with me on a comparison here um, to Donald Trump, which is not to say that, oh, Trump's just like Eric Adams, because he's not. But um, they're both in one sense, kind of um, backlash candidates. They're recipients of voter anger, uh, at least to some degree, uh, of the way that the status quo came before. Um, uh, and then they enter office, uh, especially in Trump's first term, but and Adams as well, Without a real articulated sense of what that backlash looks like as a governing program, and also to hit a Sudermanian theme, without kind of an intellectual infrastructure that's been thinking about this for a while, uh, is is corruption a kind of logical place to end up when you don't have a vision thing uh, translating populist energies into uh, into governance? Well, certainly we've seen it twice. I don't think it, uh, you know, it's totally crazy to sort of think of this as a systemic response. That's a, that's a pretty good theory. Um, I think the way you think about both of these guys is that they are candidates who whose whole shtick was, we're not doing that thing that we were just doing before. And it doesn't matter what we're doing next at all. It only mattered what we were doing before, and we're not doing that again, right? And so Trump's whole thing was everything that came before me, nope. And Eric Adams, same deal. His whole his 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 pitch to voters was everything that came before me. You hated that previous mayor, and people did for good reasons. Nope. And in both cases, they were kind of right about what came before. I think with Trump, uh, Trump was somewhat less right about the pre-Trump GOP. There were some things that I actually prefer about the pre-Trump GOP to the under-Trump GOP, but still, there was this sense that the people in charge had been irresponsible, were selfish, were lazy, uh, weren't thinking about the ordinary people, about the little guy, about the middle class in particular. They had lost touch with ordinary people's concerns. And so these were folks who said, vote for me because I'm in touch with ordinary people's concerns. And it turns out that both of them are maybe not, and they're actually kind of weirdos, right? And so this is, you know, uh, the the Tim Walls line about Donald Trump and J.D. Vance and the MAGA right right now is they're weird. Well, guess what? Eric Adams is oh, weird. It's really weird. And the whole apparatus that is surrounding him, the political sort of, uh, you know, New York machine that is supporting him is also weird. And you read this indictment and it whether or not 
these allegations are true in a legal or criminal sense, they make pretty clear that this is a campaign. This is a, a, a political office that is just full of absolute weirdos. And they have they have successfully indicted him on being weird. Catherine, um, the governor, uh, Kathy Hochul, uh, has the power to remove Eric Adams if need be. Uh, first of all, is that's what what the hell? Uh, and second of all, uh, should she? Yeah, the the like Matrushka doll of idiocy here. Like it just keeps growing. Like Kathy Hochul is our only hope. Like <laughs> this is very bad news. Um, I I don't know whether or not she should remove him. I, I guess it depends a little on how the city would tolerate a perceived big footing um, rather than simply removing him on their own in an electoral manner later. Generally, I prefer for people to be removed from office by elections rather than other types of procedures because that's why we have elections. Um, I do think that this whole thing is like a secretly a case against um, like certain types of campaign finance reforms that the city has tried, by the way, because the the $10 million, right? There was this figure like $10 million is um, the money that Adams obtained as a result of false certifications. And and I think it's it's important to like be clear about what that money is, because it's not that that's the money he got from bribes or or, you know, compensation of various kinds. It's taxpayer matched campaign funds. So he basically put this illicitly obtained money into a box that should have contained only uh, contributions from city residents and got that money matched buy taxpayer money for his campaign. It's like such a spectacular failure of the idea of publicly funded campaigns and elections that you would think that like this alone would just make everyone be like, OK, that didn't work. We have to stop doing this. This this thing is over. Um, and instead, we're going to be like, oh, here's $10 million in taxpayer money. And also, I guess maybe Kathy Hochul will remove you now. Like none of this is efficient. None of this makes sense. So when I say maybe we just do it with elections, I do recognize that the elections are also utterly screwed up. That's one half of a uh, illegal scheme there, Nick. Uh, the other half is uh, foreign governments. Right. And uh, keeping in mind that the investigations allegedly are not just about uh, Turkey, but also about Israel, China, Qatar, South Korea and Uzbekistan, which has a lot of spare money. Fucking to Uzbekistan. You know, <laughs> you got to draw a line on that. Uh, the, the next up, Turk shitty stand is going to come in. Uh, no, uh, the uh, but which is to say that it's illegal. That's federal law now, not New York law, to have foreign money um, be donated to uh, uh, domestic American political campaigns. Is that federal law correct? Should we just say screw it? Free money, free minds, free markets, free free Uzbeki dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's I I actually think this is a good question. I was going to um, uh, originally just respond by saying of course all election laws are designed not to actually make money clean or dirty, but to give whoever's in power, you know, an endless op set of opportunities to uh, uh to investigate people and charge them with crimes that may or may not be crimes or whatever. And uh, Brian Doherty from uh, our recent colleague back in the late 90s or early 2000s did a great story about two guys who tried to unseat the speaker of or the the head of the um, yeah, I think it was the speaker of the California state legislature or state Senate. And they did a true grassroots campaign. They failed in their their uh, bid by a couple things. They got it on the ballot. And then the guy who they failed to unseat unleashed his friend who ran the California Elections Commission and pummeled these guys, which what up to that point was the largest dollar fine for abrogating or, you know, going around um, election campaign laws, which they didn't even understand and which nobody could understand. And so there's that argument to just say all of this stuff is just a way of making sure that the people in power have an endless array of weapons to point at people they dislike. On another level, it seems to me that if there is a law that makes sense, which is to say that um, you know direct campaign contributions to uh, people running for office in America should not be coming from foreign uh, governments. Um, how do you enforce that? I don't know. And as always in this, I fall back to 
uh, the uh, you know the point of if people cared about this, candidates would be certifying their own dollar flows to say you know when going to independent agencies uh, that would audit them and say you know what this is where their campaign finances are coming from and things like that. The good news uh, in a lot of ways is that you know over the past twenty years. Uh, um, you know, and because of, you know, various changes in the ability of, um, uh, uh, you know, since Citizens United and a couple of other things, it's really not about the campaigns themselves. It is, you know, they don't actually matter as much as they used to. So I don't get I don't lose a lot of sweep, sleep worrying about Uzbekistan, um, you know, uh, tipping the, the scale of American elections. What I do worry about, Matt, is the people who will replace Eric Adams oh, yeah. because you can always get dumber and stupider or more rotten and more corrupt in New York. And like the two main people who will replace him, if Kathy Hochul removes him, there's also a way that the city itself, a kind of weird melange of city council people and uh, whatnot, can actually unseat the mayor whenever they want to. It's complicated. And I don't think that it's ever actually been done. But, uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo is one of the leading contenders to replace him, which would be, you know, hasn't he killed enough people? <laughs> like, what? why would you bring back Andrew Cuomo to anything other than a dunking booth, you know, anywhere in, in, in New York State, much less New York City? And Jumani uh, Williams, who's the public advocate in New York, who is like not, he is like to the left of the Democratic Socialists. Yes. Um, and is a possibly an even bigger idiot than Eric Adams has been. And unlike Eric Adams, he has a focus plan to kind of really right all the wrongs in New York, which would probably do more to devastate, you know, uh, uh, you know, the city than anything Uzbekistan could ever come up with. Yeah, sometimes there's advantages to having a, a backlash candidate who doesn't have a plan because, in fact, the alternative is a, a candidate who does have a plan and it's a really bad one. Uh, Peter, real quick. Um, uh, New York is governed horribly. Uh, Chicago, gross. Uh, L.A., crap hole uh, from governance uh, point of view. Uh, the District of Columbia, where you people live, uh, not so great uh, either. Is there off the top of your head a... Um, city that's managed well? Uh, the answer I'm going to give you is the closest I can come up with is the city of Boston, where I have spent some time this year. The city of Boston has, um, uh, it just like walking around it, um, it's great. And it's like, it doesn't feel sort of like, what the hell happened here in the way that Washington, D.C. often feels these days, in the way that New York has sometimes felt uh, in the days after the pandemic, the years after the pandemic, I should say, uh, in the way that like Seattle and San Francisco just appear to be kind of real messes, real shit show cities, in, uh, at least at times for the last several years. And Boston does not feel like that. And one thing that Boston has done very well is they have kept murders down. I don't have the exact stats oh, in yeah, front of me. Incredible. but there were like just just an incredibly low number of murders. I want to say that like as of May or June, I to be clear, I don't have the I'm not looking at the actual numbers. It's possible I'm a little off here. But as of May or June, this May or June, the city of Boston proper had something like six murders, whereas Washington, D.C. was getting really excited that maybe we would have fewer than 200 this year. Right. By the end of the year, and it was like over, you know, it was had like already hit 100 by the time, you know, that the midsummer had gone through. And so obviously there's some differences there just because Boston is split into a bunch of jurisdictions and Boston proper does not encompass all of Boston. So there's a little bit of kind of gameskeeping there, right, in, in terms of the way the numbers are produced. But Boston actually seems to be doing somewhat better than a bunch of those other cities. And it's not, it, it's not a red city. It's not a libertarian city. There's a bunch of stuff here that all of us would, uh, would disagree with, would be like, that's stupid, that sucks. And yet, in terms of just keeping a city kind of like, this feels like the city should feel. This feels like things are open and there's not probably a crime happening down the street as I walk by just like on, on my, you know, my morning walk uh, to get coffee. Like Boston does a better job than any other city I have been in post pandemic. All right. Speaking of uh, corruption, the head of a country uh, previously well known for the stuff, Ukraine uh, was in America last week visiting the United Nations and a weapons manufacturing plant in a swing state. Uh, and also meeting with uh, both major party uh, candidates for presidents. The uh, current occupant of that particular job, Joseph Robinette Biden II, 
uh, announced another eight billion or so in aid to Ukraine uh, in its two and a half year war against an invading Russia, adding to the 175 billion or so that have, has already been uh, earmarked. Uh, there, Catherine uh, Zelensky really, really, really wanted Biden to approve uh, him being able to use U.S. made missiles inside Russian territory. And Biden said, uh, come on, man. Uh, and no. Uh, was that the correct call from the American president? I mean, I hate to give you the meta answer, but mostly as I was reading the coverage of this, I just why is this Joe Biden's decision? Like, how have we gotten ourselves into this situation where this man that we have decided is not fit to run for a second term, who is very confused about what is going on in many of the conversations that I have seen him be involved in on television in recent weeks, is the guy who is going to potentially determine the outcome of this fairly important world historical conflict. So I I, I have this feeling that, like, yeah, probably it's not a good idea for us to for the U.S. government to give long-range missiles for Zelensky to fire into uh, deep into Russia. That seems like that might actually make things worse, if you asked me. But you know what? You shouldn't be asking me. You shouldn't be asking Joe Biden. It seems like maybe the people waging that conflict should be the deciders. And um, the fact that the fact that we have we are so tangled up in this network of of interdependence and kind of U.S. as the world's arbiter, policeman, weapons dealer, et cetera, is not a good place to be. Uh, well, the reason the people that are, uh, you know, in that conflict aren't making the decisions is that we're supplying them the weapons. Yes, I understand that. Right. Uh, I mean, this is so this is this is like as long as that's happening, we have a say in it. Right. Uh, this is what uh, I'm what saying. It's like we, think. we should not so, be the world's arms yeah. dealer. We should not be. And we certainly or, shouldn't be simultaneously serving the role of, I mean, not even dealer, just gifter. Well, we yeah, those are two pretty different things, right? Like the uh, the morality or perceived morality of that is like, hey, we can be uh, we can be a bazaar in Saudi Arabia. Come on in. Come on into the bazaar. Buy some stuff. Uh, Israel, buy some stuff, whatever. Um, it's a different question of like, OK, we will give you this right. military That's aid. But we we condition things so much. I mean, it's almost like it, when I lived in Ohio, you, you could buy fireworks in Ohio, but you had to sign a little affidavit saying that you would remove these from the state within 48 hours and you would not set them off, you know, in the great state of Ohio. And it's kind of like if we are giving weapons, I, you know, it seems kind of absurd that we would be conditioning those gifts so much. It's like getting money from your parents who are like, okay, here's $20, but you can't buy booze or cigarettes with it or something. I'm with Catherine here, broadly speaking, where the U.S., well, or actually I, I am with you in spirit, but differ. We should not be gifting people things. And then when we sell stuff to people, that's it. The deal's final and it's on them what they do with it. Um, but this... The the this is one of those weird attempts by the U.S. to kind of still control world events in a way that I don't think that we should be doing. And with something like Ukraine, um, you know, there is a stark choice, at least in terms of presidential candidates. Kamala Harris has said that she will, you know, or she said in the debate with with uh, Trump, you know, she was hinting at we're going to, you know, we'll we'll pay any price, we'll bear any burden to maintain the territorial integrity of Ukraine before uh, Putin invaded or, or took Crimea and, you know, how, how it was at the end of the Cold War uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Trump said, I would I would settle it quickly, um, meaning that he would allow Putin to keep some version of things like that. It's clear why Zelensky is more friendly towards Democrats, uh, but that might also be a foolish choice because they're not going to be, we're not going to pay any price and things like that. Um, so this, I think this visit and this is where I agree with Catherine, I think, in spirit, this is why America should be less interventionist in general. Like we need to we need to be stark and clear in our defense commitments and back those to the hilt, but they should be fewer than what we have. It also is if you look at the cast of characters who are involved here, it's just such a, a good reminder that, you know, people have this theoretical commitment to the US as being, you know, a moral country or a, the world superpower in a way that might be a force for good. But then it's like, OK, well, what does that actually look like in the next couple of years? And it's like right now it looks like Joe Biden, who can barely function. It looks like Donald Trump, maybe, uh, you know, a year from now, who is saying stuff like, 
I have really good relations with people on both sides. And Zelensky is forced to say, I hope we have more good relations with you than Putin. And Trump's like, eh. We'll see, Ish. you know, and, uh, and we have and in the Middle East Sorry. Kamala Harris, who I don't know what she would do in this scenario. And the fact that we don't she really was raised know. in a middle class household. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. She, <laughs> she would fire them like a single mother. Right. Did, do we think like she just fell out of the coconut yeah. tree? No, she is a product of all that came before her and all that will have been or she's whatever. Burdened, um, she's burdened by what came before her. Right. But also we're not policy. going back. Anyway, yeah. all that is to say, like these these three characters who would theoretically be deciders, like none, none of whom strike me as strong candidates for the moral voice for the for the arbiter of what is right and wrong in foreign policy and certainly not in this conflict. Yeah. And then when you throw it into the Middle East, where we are gifting people every basically every major country in that in that region, we are simultaneously on their side. So we have a massive military base in Qatar, Egypt, until you know recent uh, stuff, including Ukraine. Egypt was always the second largest beneficiary after Israel of American foreign aid, uh, you know, which means weapons and things like that. And you know, it, it gets complicated very quickly. I think I think Ukraine and I think Israel both have an absolute right to defend their territorial integrity. I can also understand. I I don't understand the the, the military uh, tactics in Ukraine. But it could well be that you lobbing some, you know, mid-range American missiles into Russia would help Ukraine end the war better on their terms. And it's kind of like that should be their call. But then if it's going to bring us into, you know, to bear on all of this stuff, it's really problematic. And Matt, my question for you is like, how does this affect you or how do, how do you read this particularly with one of the big things that Zelensky is looking for supposedly on this trip is NATO membership? And obviously, the U.S. gets to determine a lot of what happens in NATO. So how, how do you factor that kind of stuff into this larger question that you My raised? My position on NATO membership, which has always been an outlier in the uh, libertarian world, um, is influenced by me uh, covering um, the expansion, initial expansion of NATO in the early 1990s on the ground from the countries that were advocating for it, which was not the US, but it was mm -hmm. uh, Poland, the former Czechoslovakia and Hungary at that time. Um, and uh, so uh, the rules that were uh, affixed to the expansion of NATO back then, uh, because Washington and Bill Clinton were very reluctant uh, at first to do that, uh, were that you had to solve all outstanding diplomatic border relationships with your immediate neighbors. Um, including, yeah, including like wh wh where it is the border. Um, you had to not have any problems with neighboring uh, ethnic minorities uh, live in your country who are, uh, you know, are, are the same ethnicity or speak the same language as neighboring countries, and a bunch of other things besides having to do with uh, your transition to a liberal democracy and so forth. It was tough to get in. It took a while, um, and I think to the extent that NATO. Um, uh, should have been expanded. Uh, and let's keep in mind that the reason that it was, was because those countries were seeking a security guarantee and nobody uh, in Western Europe uh, uh, was able to or or mustered the courage to say, okay, we're going to have a Western European or a European only based security structure. Uh, everyone says, like, yeah, no, nah, it seems like, oh, that's a hassle. Uh, let's just let's just keep doing this one. Um, so that's why we had uh, an expansion there is uh, NATO. So uh, my feeling is like, OK, if there's nothing else um, and uh, NATO is going to expand, then OK, then you have to jump through those hoops. Um, those hoops stopped being hoops pretty soon after that. Uh, so I would I think it's a terrible idea to have uh, Ukraine join NATO um, because for the same reasons why you wouldn't have done that in 1994 or five when they first started talking about that, because they have big unresolved disputes with a neighbor, which kind of puts a lot of the countries in Russia's near abroad in this kind of permanent jeopardy, jeopardy until Russia start, stops being an expansionist, revanchist country. Uh, true. But then again, we just can't solve all the world's problems. So uh, I don't think that you, I, I think that the US should act, actually say, you're not joining NATO. We can't do it right now. Um, uh, like the, the way that the system, the alliance is structured, uh, it would be too destabilizing to have you join NATO. But I, I will acknowledge that I have an incredibly idiosyncratic take that almost nobody else in the world has. So that's, uh, that's 
uh, not particularly useful, but it at least is responsive to your question. Um, I'm going to stop that uh, part of the topic and let's get to our listener question of the week from someone in Prague. So there's that. But first, a word from our sponsor over at the University of Chicago. Friends, in an election year, it's too easy to get all lost in the supermarket of news and opinion. Understanding the real life impact of political events can be a damn challenge in a summer Olympics year. So have we got a podcast for you? It's called Not Another Politics Podcast, brought to you by the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. Not Another Politics Podcast provides clear research-driven perspectives on the biggest issues of the day. Get the insights you need to truly understand the political landscape. Uh, no spin, just facts. Subscribe today at harris.uchicago.edu slash N-A-P-P. That's harris.uchicago.edu slash N-A-P-P. Or just look for Not Another Politics Podcast wherever you acquire your podcasts. Do it today. You'd be glad you did. All right. Reminder, email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Jake Hunt. Uh, from Prague. Hi, all. Big fan of Reason and the podcast. I skate the line between conservative and libertarian and so have loved all the crossover uh, between the Reason Dispatch National Review Extended Universe on recent podcasts. This leads me to my question, which is a thought experiment. It's 2027 or so. Somehow, miraculously, a post-Trump political scene is emerging. <laughs> and there's a fight for the future of a post-Trump GOP. There is a GOP candidate who Reason types actually find not perfect, but intriguing. Somebody who might get the vote of a roundtable panelist. Uh-huh. Uh, despite not lining up on everything. But they also fit more or less within the broad continuum of the GOP, which in this thought experiment at least stands a chance of shifting back toward its 1980 to 2015 borders. What are some of the elements of this candidate's platform? What issues would he or she emphasize? And how would he or she address the constant big topics like ec economy, uh, immigration, uh, abortion? Hmm. In short, what might a libertarian-minded conservative campaign and agenda look like? Could it attract new voters or disrupt the 2016 to 2024 stasis? Uh, Catherine, I feel like this question is totally not for you, um, but can you at least sketch out, uh, uh, channel your inner Stephanie Slade and tell us what you would like to see. Yeah, uh, I, tr I try to channel my inner Stephanie Slade as much as humanly possible. Uh, so I will do it here. And the answer is, uh, is her answer, which is some kind of fusionism. It's, uh, you know, there has been a long, long history of uh, a kind of conservatism that it recognizes its reliance on a kind of libertarianism. That is um, the idea that you cannot have a virtuous country without having a free one and perhaps vice versa. Um, all of that is quite abstract. I think that the kind of policy answer to this question is just somebody who actually gave just one shit about the debt. Just just <laughs> one. Like, that's all I'm asking at this point. My standards are so low. They are bargain basement. Like, not just a, like a little passing rhetoric, but if somebody did a campaign where they said, we are going to take seriously the fact that we are spending money we don't have we are creating all kinds of problems in the process and um, and centered their campaign campaign around that. I would be willing to tolerate an awful lot of things I otherwise don't like uh, if a candidate could convince me that they were going to act on that. Right. It is not enough for me to hear some words that sound good. I would need a plan of action. Um, some of the other topics that were mentioned, like um, immigration and abortion, I could I could see myself backing a candidate who is just really, really hardcore uh, pro-immigration, who just said, I don't know, I can't fix I can't fix anything else, but I am going to I am going to hugely, hugely, hugely expand legal immigration. And again, told me a story about how they were actually going to do it. Um, and I think. I can say all this stuff and never be pushed off of my I'm never going to vote. Uh, platform because no one's going to do this. This isn't a thing that's going to happen. And so, you know, from that perspective, maybe I'm not being responsive to the question, but theoretically, these people exist. <clears throat> Mitch Daniels. Uh, Peter, uh, you're from Florida. Um, is uh, this basically Ron DeSantis minus culture war? Mm, it's maybe Ron DeSantis minus culture war, but replaced by totally different people, and none of whom are Ron DeSantis. <laughs> uh, I so, get it. Uh, 
So I one way to think about the answer to this question for our conservative libertarian listener is I think that you could come up with a candidate who would maybe not intensely appeal, but certainly a, a lot of us would be like, this person is a basically good candidate. If you just mixed and matched, if you created a cocktail of previous Republican candidates, right? And combine them all together. You're not, you wouldn't have to invent anything that that uh, that are, it would be totally new for a Republican to get all of us to say, this person is maybe not great, but at least pretty good. And this person would probably sound something like Paul Ryan on entitlements and, um, and, uh, and, and the budget process. Yes, um, wouldn't necessarily do what Paul Ryan did, but would propose stuff that looked something like the early versions of the Paul Ryan plan. This person would probably sound like Nikki Haley on abortion. Uh, this person would probably sound like Ronald Reagan on immigration. And this person might even sound a little bit like Donald Trump on things like school choice and education reform. And that person would end up being a lot like, as Catherine said, Mitch Daniels. The answer is always Mitch Daniels, but you don't have to have, you don't have to just say, well, it's Mitch Daniels who called for a truce on the culture war and actual responsibility in terms of governance and fiscal policy. You can say, look, there, there is an actual history of libertarian leaning positions uh, amongst prominent members, not just sort of crazy backbenchers or anything like that, prominent leading members of the Republican Party over the last 40 years. And you can just pull from what they have done, or at least what they have said, maybe not what they've done. Let's go with pull from what they have said and take those positions and mash them up into a libertarian-esque, libertarian, uh, like a uh, conservatarian cocktail president who might be not terrible. Uh, Nick, save us from mm -hmm. Paul Ryan, please. Yeah, I want to point out when we invoke Ronald Reagan, and I think I'm getting the math right, but Ronald yes, Reagan's yes. first election was closer to the bombing of Pearl Harbor than we are to the election of Ronald Reagan. Just okay, but how close was Nirvana's he to the, mind? yes, Nirvana, yeah, that's no. it. So, <laughs> Same joke. And Ronald Reagan, <laughs> what, he went, uh, he had Alzheimer's rather than actually have to deal with the release of Nevermind and the rise of <laughs> punk music. That's true. What do you think Joe Biden knows is coming? Oh, yeah. 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 He, Joe Biden. I, like, what, this, rock, what, what, what pop music trend is he avoiding? by uh, Maybe he's, sinking maybe into he's worried about the release of Avatar 3. I, uh, Matt, my vision of a, of a Republican candidate who would appeal to libertarians and conservatives, and, and it starts with an understanding that conservatives have to suck it up. They are the past, and they have always been the past. They used to brag about standing athwart history yelling stop or maybe that was the woman that they were on top of i don't know oh. but conservatives are over and they are in the past they're stuck in the past and they have lost they have lost they had many years to govern when they said we had people who are great conservatives who are in office and they fucking screwed the pooch every chance they got they didn't cut spending they didn't cut entitlements they didn't cut the government's reach into the boardroom much less you know and they tried to extend it and have succeeded in various ways extending it into the board uh, into the bedroom so for me what I envision is a candidate that would be kind of like Ron Paul on Lipitor, where what they would be preaching is a positive vision of America as a land of, you know, it is a land of opportunity. It, it real, And it starts with the vision and with the vibe, which is that America is the place where people came to write their own stories and where people will continue to come. And if we are a successful nation, we will bring more people from abroad, but we will also be allowing the people who were born here and have lived here for years and decades and generations to write their own stories, which are always going to be different and ever changing and things like that. And it starts, the, the new era begins with cutting government spending because government spending isn't just tax money that is going to be paid by our great grandchildren or the avatar aliens who take over the planet or whatever. It is also the extent of government control over so many aspects of our lives. And we have, that is why growth is low. That is why the country is at odds with each other because we're all struggling to see what one vision gets to dictate every all the terms to everybody else. So you start with like massive cutting in government spending, which will help the debt, which will help the deficit. And then you start going down the line and saying, what are the policy changes that the federal government can enact that will allow more people to be the authors of their own story. You know, in Ron Paul, when he 
<clears throat> excuse me, emerged in 2008, and he was also saying this in 2012, you know, I don't want to be in charge of the economy because in, a, in an economy, you know, there is nobody who's planning that. I don't want to be in charge of the world because America can't do that and it shouldn't do that. And I don't want to be in charge of your lives because you're a free, autonomous individuals. And the role of the government then, and this is where it departs from a kind of Ron Paul orthodoxy, uh, you know, so we, we take Ron Paul down a notch or two. And, you know, what we will say is that government is spending on everything is being reduced. There will be a safety net for people who cannot take care of themselves, but it will be focused on giving people direct aid that will allow them to figure out how to make the next step in their lives. We are done with an entitlement state where, you know, when we talk about this almost every week, where we have this insane thing where people are getting subsidies or, or entitlements for families making up to $400,000. Can you, like, what kind of fucked up world are we in where people who make $400,000 are getting money from the government? It's like, go write your own fucking story, write your own checks, bounce your own checks, but you're done. Government is not for people who are making more than the median income of America or half the median income of an American household or individual. So that that's the that's the conservative uh, conser or libertarian uh, a candidate who could appeal to conservatives if they actually believe what they talk about, which is that they want less government and more control over their lives. I don't know that they will get there because in the end, you take away the culture war from Ron DeSantis and you will never hear of him again unless you go to Florida. So uh, my answer to the question, one word, afuera. Um, um, we want more Javier Malay and less uh, Victor Orban. Uh, Victor Orban is uh, in the term of the art, uh, like a lot of the European politicians and parties that Donald Trump has modeled himself after, a welfare chauvinist, um, like uh, the National Front in, in, uh, in France and elsewhere, people who are, you know, get your hands off my government everything, you immigrants. Um, and that way lies uh, impending entitlement uh, haircuts in in within the next uh, 10 years. We're going to see like across the board, oops, can't pay for it anymore. Uh, you're going to get 20% less. That is a clarifying uh, moment. Um, it's going to be uh, very uh, bad for a lot of people. You need someone uh, who is a little bit crazy, who's got who you know doesn't uh, uh, comb their hair anymore, um, based on some kind of uh, voodoo logic, and who's just ripping the band aid right and left. Um, you've seen a lot of changes happen in Argentina, uh, including uh, suddenly when you stop all the rent control stuff, prices go down, um, and people can afford uh, to live and move into apartments. We have government everywhere. There's a, a graphic going around on the internet based on a Wall Street Journal story talking about the difference in the number of U.S. counties that are receiving significant amounts of uh, federal spending now compared to 2000. And it's very eye opening. Like, Whoa, what happened there? Um, that just afuera. We just afuera, all that stuff. Department of Education, many such departments just afuera. Like we have lost the plot about all kinds of separation between the federal and the local and state governments um, and just the expectations of what uh, government is supposed to do in our lives. Um, it's sick and the bill is coming due very quick. And when, and the closer we get to that, the more that a uh, pretty radical break from the past. And when you have both parties now uh, competing with one another on the federal level, at least to be the party of tariffs uh, among and you know transfer spending, um, then there's going to be some space open for a true afuera party. I don't necessarily think or believe that it's going to be the Republican Party or the Democrats for that matter. Um, but if there was going to be anybody who uh, can tap into some of that populist juice, give me the crazy look in the eye a little bit um, uh, and who's ready to articulate that straight up and just start getting rid of stuff because we can't pay for the stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. Do we yeah, have I think time? I'd vote for the guy with the five giant dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The cloned, uh, especially libertarian. the cloned dogs. Uh, all right. Uh, I thought you were going to say we want we want more Javier Malay and less Edna St. Vincent Malay, but nobody really reads her anymore. That's um, mission uh, uh, mission accomplished. Yeah. Okay. Wish granted. Next.
Nobody goes to that literary <laughs> salon. It's too crowded. Um, all right, let's get to our end of podcast. What have we have been consuming in the literary salonosphere uh, and elsewhere? Nick, why don't you lead us off? Uh, so as uh, some of the listeners may know, um, I got married on Saturday, um, So, which was a phenomenal day and everything. But uh, the reason I bring that up is because on Sunday, just yesterday, I uh, ended my weekend on a bittersweet note, which I went to a memorial for Helen Fisher, who was an anthropologist uh, who died about a month ago from uh, cancer. Uh, she was born in 1945, died last year. And um, I, as part of that, I um, went back and looked over her body of work. Um, as an anthropologist, she, she taught for a long time at Rutgers, my alma mater, and she worked closely uh, with people like Lionel Tiger, who was there, who was an anthropologist who became kind of uh, pushed out of the mainstream. Uh, he wrote a book in the early 70s called Men in Groups, which is where the term male bonding comes from. And he was seen as an anti-feminist kind of anthropologist at an era when that was bad juju to suggest that, you know, humans, if evolution is true, that, you know, that that has implications for human behavior and human society. Helen never called herself a feminist, although she lived an incredible kind of like um, uh, Nellie Bly sort of life where she was never a tenure track academic and she just cut and blazed her own path through both serious academic research circles as well as popular science writing and things like that. And what she managed to do in a way that I think very few people are capable anymore, she seared clear of saying everything is determined or everything is open. And um, it was a really beautiful way of talking about how humans act and interact. Uh, she became known as kind of like the the doctor of love because she studied mating behaviors in, you know, first in chimps and then in humans. Uh, she was the chief scientist for Match.com, uh, the dating site, and uh, was part of this massive ongoing research project uh, where they uh, uh, match would do does an annual survey of single people in America, not simply match.com people, but a representative survey of people who are single and kind of figuring out what is going on through that. I interviewed her for reason in 2022 about that, where she explained why the hot vac summer of 2021 never happened. And it was she had predicted it all along that it was not going to happen for various reasons. Um, so she's a, just a wonderful person. Her most recent published book was Anatomy of Love, which was a revised version of an earlier work that is one of the uh, one of a kind of classic of cultural anthropology of the past 50 years. And what is uh, amazing and uh, kind of a wonderful thing to think about on her, literally on her deathbed, she was finishing her last manuscript, which is going to be published early next year, a book called Thinking Four Ways, How to Connect with Anyone Using Neuroscience. Um, she says in an epilogue to that manuscript, which she completed just five days before she died, <clears throat> because of the work she had done in that book, she says, I now know far more about our ancestors, those around the world today and those of tomorrow. I have a rich new understanding of all humankind. A life dream for her has come true. Um, and it, um, it, she's, it, it's, a book to look forward to because she's one of the essential guides to a whole world of uh, such a powerful and meaningful world of human activity of love of mating of sorting of sex of organization that comes from all of that um i you know i spent the weekend thinking a lot and going back through helen fisher's work thank you for that nick uh catherine yeah, I'll just put, I guess, an extra note on that as well, which is, um, you know, her her love story with John Tierney, who I worked for many years ago, is uh, an incredible one and also a cruel, a cruel one um, because they found each other late in life. Um, and about a month before she died, she sent out an email to a bunch of people that was her attempt to pass along the news of her imminent demise and spare John having to do it which is like it literally had a PS that was like, don't don't send John emails right now. He's pretty bummed um, about her death. So just beautiful and sad. Um, I, to shift gears, uh, read Wide Saragasso Sea, which is um, a 1966 novel uh, by Jean Reese. Uh, and it is the 
retell it's a sort of retelling. It is the story of the mad woman in the attic, the wife who is uh, basically a plot device in Jane Eyre. Right. Um, so Charlotte Bronte mentions kind of in passing in Jane Eyre, there's this Creole wife in the attic. Uh, we don't know a lot about her. Um, and this book, it just takes that and runs with it to absolutely wild places. Um, and it ends up being, um, you know, I think especially for 1966, both a in terms of the prose and also in terms of its approach toward trying to understand the damage of slavery and colonialism, um, really, really excellent, really um you know, I can only assume shocking and weird for its time, but it sits so much better now than so much of the literary output that is like a post-colonialist look at a classic, right? Like that that's now like an exhausting and often infuriating genre. And this is just a tiny little book that says, hey, maybe some of the madness here is about where she came from. And it's it's set um, at least initially in the post-slavery abolition act, Jamaica, and, and kind of goes from there. Um, this is not a novel recommendation. This book has been a big deal since it came out in the 60s. But um, why did Sarah Gasso see? If you want to try to read something, something post-colonialism, something, something feminist retelling, that doesn't suck. Yeah, it's really good. There is a mediocre movie that was made of it. And I, yeah, I, the, the book is, it's like the best version of that, where somebody takes a, a marginal character and then spins out a whole story. It's so really great. Peter, what did you consume? I watched Francis Ford Coppola's new self-funded opus, Megalopolis, a movie that has been in the works since maybe the 1970s, back when Francis Ford Coppola had what is arguably the best four-movie run of any director ever, with the first two Godfather films, The Conversation and Apocalypse. Those movies were incredible. Sadly, Megalopolis is not. It threatens to be very, very interesting, because what it opens with is a... Uh, a sort of fantasy political scenario in which something like New York City is still the Roman Empire. Uh, but the city is having really serious fiscal problems and also is kind of a disordered mess. And so they bring in this federal league empowered architect to knock it down and rebuild the city. And so maybe, maybe this is going to be a movie that's about zoning reform and public <laughs> debt and all the stuff that's really interesting in American life. And, and, and it's like comes very close to being that movie. And then it's just not. What is this movie about? I'm not entirely sure. I could it the, the big problem with this movie is that it has no straightforward narrative through line. It's very it's it's really kind of confusing and inchoate. It gestures though at this idea that is I think a a really interesting libertarian idea of uh, what uh, what would it mean to rethink society from the ground up? Why are we just stuck here doing the things that we've always done, trying to do them maybe just a little bit better, trying to meet the needs of the now? Instead, what we should be doing is building the world that we want for our future. This is a great idea. Sadly, the movie does not deliver on this idea. It is just too much of a mess. It has a uh, it also just doesn't look very good. It's, there's a digital sheen to it that really kind of makes it look like it was shot on like an iPhone 4. I mean, it's just, it's sort of ugly looking and it just, and frankly, just hard to follow. But there is some absolutely bonkers, crazy stuff. So if you like bonkers, crazy stuff in your movies, like uh, all of the political elites of New Rome, the, the New York, going to Madison Square Garden and watching a circus that involves pro wrestling and, uh, like the horse and chariot race fight things and also like maybe some drunken bacchanalia and poisoning and it's just like crazy crazy stuff that's happening here it's it's so insane on so many levels you kind of have to admire its ambition even though that ambition is incredibly clumsy so the great thing about this movie like i said is that it gestures at this idea of greatness and of sort of rethinking our lives and society and everything about our world from the ground up but if you're going to make a movie about greatness you need to show us some. 
And there just isn't any real greatness in this movie. Coppa skates, I think, because he has delivered greatness in the past. That four film run is truly incredible, especially when you consider that the first of those movies, The Godfather, was shot uh, when he was like something like 29 years old. Um, and so he is he is reminding us that greatness is possible. Sadly, as he is not actually demonstrating real greatness in this this movie. I think this is one for uh, for people who are very curious about what Coppola is up to and what you can do with a hundred million dollars when there's no big studio standing over you saying, hey, maybe this should make sense. Uh, it's kind of interesting in that respect. Sadly, it just doesn't quite work. He uh, has a really bad track record when he finances his own pictures. You know, sometimes that's because a true genius is being held back by the suits. Most of the time, it's because nobody will invest in it because it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Was uh, Tucker uh, a man in his dream the other example of that? Yep. Or was it a cotton club? Uh, yeah, it was more while well, the Cotton Club things started to devolve. Tucker, A Man in His Dream is pretty good if yeah. it's a little bit kind of an obvious allegory about a genius who gets fucked over by the suits and or I the mean, federal th government. This is the thing is that uh, while he with the, yeah. Megalopolis kind of wants to be a grand movie about like thinking about the meaning of society. But fundamentally, it is very clearly just about Hollywood and about yeah. how no one appreciates Francis Ford Coppola anymore. <laughs> and you know what? I. I I kind of I get it. Like he has earned that right. Again, if you directed the greatest four film run in directorial history, you have a like you have a lifetime pass as far as I'm concerned to do to make crazy movies and to say I'm the greatest. Why won't people listen to me? He was the greatest. Sadly, Megalopolis doesn't just doesn't deliver on that promise. I think that can only be said by somebody who has not watched one from the heart at least twice. That is true. It's been about 15 years. Yeah. Uh, he has a terrible track record, really, since, you know, the 80s. Um, the Outsiders was pretty good. Um, so uh, my... That was the 80s. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, since my, Catherine and I were born. Yeah. Consumption. We caused uh, it. Is a uh, musical artist who I've been recommended uh, several times and I uh, have uh, not adopted or not uh, dipped in because... When you're old, it's like friends. You don't need new ones. Um, uh, and I finally uh, went in. You uh, just need fewer. You need fewer. Uh, <laughs> Sturgill Simpson, uh, his name is uh, a uh, kind of outlaw country, uh, Waylon Jennings type figure who started his career kind of late in his mid uh, 30s, 10 years ago with a very uh, Waylon Jennings sounding uh, record, it's, which is great. Um, he has a new one out, uh, came out just two months ago. Uh, under his kind of new recording name, because he's sort of uh, irritatingly weird, uh, uh, Johnny Blue Skies. Um, don't ask, uh, don't tell. Uh, but it's called Passage du Désir, which I understand um, uh, might mean in French a passage of desire. Uh, so he's this guy who started off as sort of a, like a outlaw country, a really big uh, uh, voice uh, and everything. And then he kind of got increasingly psychedelic and then kind of lost his mind in a record called Sound and Fury um, and uh, just made like a, a trash synth record uh, then. And then COVID came, so he made two bluegrass records and quit his record label. And now he's created this Johnny Blue Skies guy, and this is the second of those uh, records. Um, it is uh, a, uh, compared to his earlier work, um, it is uh, kind of mellow. He's singing in a lower register and quiet, um, almost like Yacht Rocky in a way. He's got a song that uh, sounds the most Jimmy Buffett of any non-Jimmy Buffett song I've heard in a long time. That's a compliment uh, called Scootin' My Blues Away or Scooter My Blues Away. Uh, very good. But then uh, uh, he throws in some absolutely like emotionally lacerating uh, uh, stuff there about a dead friend, about the disillusion of what sounds like a marriage and some other stuff, but just really, really interesting. It's sticking to me. He's the first new musical artist I've let into my world in a really long time. Uh, and I'm kind of just binge uh, 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 consuming him on the ask your robot to shuffle songs by, uh, but the passage du désir, and I'm just botching that on purpose, uh, record, uh, is, a, a very, very interesting, um, uh, strange and very memorable, uh, record. And, uh, and it's, it's worth your time to look into his, uh, not just, uh, uh, audio output, but, um, he was on Saturday night live like seven years ago and just absolutely ripped the doors down. Very interesting guy, Sturgill Simpson, check it out. Johnny blue skies, whatever the hell. Uh, but it's really good.
Nick, I heard you clearing. He's uh, playing Forest Hills. He plays Forest Hills uh, Stadium on October 19th, Matt Welch. I'm going to be there, Nick Gillespie. A uh, rare right. showing at a live concert uh, by uh, by yours truly since I discovered him four days ago. Like, yeah, let's go in. All in. All right. That's all the in uh, we have time for on this particular podcast right now. Uh, listen to all of our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. We also have a bunch of events. It's getting kind of crazy between now and uh, Election Day. Um, speaking of which, as mentioned last week, I don't know if there's even any tickets available yet, but you can get on a waiting list. If nothing else, the recent roundtable live, uh, at the village underground in New York city on November 4th, a Monday, we will be doing that should be really fun. Uh, we will get some jugglers and maybe Sturgill Simpson. We'll see, uh, Francis Ford, uh, Coppola. That's how I pronounce his name. Uh, Peter Suderman, uh, maybe we'll show up and probably won't. Hey man, uh, but anyways, I don't it, even drink wine. Uh, so, uh, Nick, are there some other events between now and then that you would like to advertise at the end of this podcast? Uh, sure. And there are tickets, uh, the ticket go to event or go to reason.com slash events, and you'll see where you can buy tickets for the reason Roundtable live, uh, in New York city on November 4th. And then on October 24th, I'm going to be doing a live interview taping, uh, reason interview taping with Musa Al Garbi talking about his book. We have never been woke. He's a sociologist who's talking about how white left-wing progressives shifted so far to the left, far, far, far away, even from the racial and ethnic minorities and underclass uh, populations that they claim to represent uh, in this book. It's fascinating. He's a great uh, figure and a great talker. That's on October 24th. But if you go to reason.com slash events, you, you can find out information about those events as well as a bunch of others. Where there's Soho Forum debates and other things happening as well. Great. Um, and if you like what we do as an organization, please consider giving a tax deductible donation at reason.com slash donate. Uh, that's all we have. See you next week. Thank you for listening.